unser Volk hilft dir selbst. Jeder soll helfen. Hitler, Sieg! In 1942, when Oleg Gwazhevsky, then a 19-year-old Catholic boy, pledged to lay his life on the line for Jutta Kinstler, a 20-year-old Jewish girl on the run, he knew exactly what he was getting into. The Germans had invaded and occupied Poland three years earlier and had rapidly begun implementing the most venal aspect of Nazi ideology, systematically removing the Jewish population through relocation and mass murder. Oleg fully understood that if they were captured and Jutta's true identity were revealed, they would both share the same fate. For the Nazi regime had programmed its minions to kill all Jews and anyone protecting a Jew. Mom and I were always on the run trying to stay ahead of the Nazis. And as they say, it's difficult to uh, hit a moving tra target. So we would travel on the train from one place to another. And uh, at the same time, trying to make a living here because we had no money. And uh, then moving again, maybe buying something over there that they had and bring to another place uh, that was needed. Until one day, the, the German came on the train and asked for documents, everybody, and they got suspicious what we have in our uh, basket there. And here we have kielbasa and eggs, and they started to ask us, where did you get it? How much did you pay for it? And we started to deny. But they got suspicious about mom that uh, she looked Jewish. So they took us off the train and uh, arrested us. They brought us to the Gestapo station, a few kilometers away, which was Stalova Vola. Ironically, this was the very same town where Oleg had first met Jutta after she'd fled the Nazis in Rohaten. Stalova Vola, where their relationship had begun, now looked like the place where it could end. Yes, this was the building. That's right. Mom was on this side of the basement, and I was over here. Yes. Despite the limitations of his vision, Oleg recognizes the bullet-riddled Gestapo headquarters to which he and Jutta were taken in 1942. A plaque in Polish confirms this is a historical site. They told you the patriots here, one by one, they broke their spirit, they broke the, until they uh, admit uh, who they were or what they did, and then they shot them, and uh, who knows where they dumped them. But this was uh, one by one. The Gestapo tortured. They wanted to destroy you and consequently to uncover information. Their methods were ruthless, they were persistent, and they were not limited by anything whatsoever. Jews, especially city Jews, were deeply afraid of dogs. And the use of dogs to intimidate Jews was widespread. This is the, the Villa of Terror here. It just says... A cosmic flashback. The dog is an eerie reminder of my parents' own unique experience here. And with the dogs here, uh, boy, the dog saved my life because <laughs> he t the dog threw himself against the Gestapo when he was hitting me with the whip uh, with lead at the end. And when <laughs> they came with the vicious dog to mom, he brought out a big dog, a German shepherd, and started after him. He should bite me, he should do... And that dog just looked at me, and I just said... I talked Polish to the dog. Come here, dog. Come here, dog. I'm sure you are better than he is. He's a worse dog. I talked to that German like you talk to a dog, because... When you don't care, that's how you are. So obviously, it was not meant. The dog knew 
to save our life. After a certain point, Martin, I was not that scared because I didn't know if anybody of my family survived, if there is a place to go. I knew I'm pregnant and I didn't have a pot to pee. So whatever, the soon, I was just praying the sooner the better and just painless. I wanted to die. The, haven't you heard that some people at certain situation want to go? <sighs> they couldn't get any confession and they got frustrated and they said they hell with him, take him to the woods and, and shoot him. And it was these woods, right? So these, these were the woods here. And that uh, Gestapo, I never forget his face, pulled his revolver and ordered us to walk. And as we were walking, my blood was hitting my ears and pounding. I knew that I will die, but I asked myself, why so soon? I have never done anything wrong. I have never harmed anyone. And uh, my wife at the same time started to talk uh, loud that the Gestapo could hear. As we go into the woods, and it's in August, and the sun is shining, and it smells, and so many field flowers, and I say to myself, my God, my child will never see something like this. God, how could you let an unborn child die without seeing the marvels of your, of your world? And we had that pounding in our ear. We didn't even hear any steps behind us. And at one point, somehow, it got quiet, like, like we were completely exhausted and there was quietness we uh, we stopped we turned back and there was no one behind us so we continue walking being afraid that maybe uh, some trap was set for us we walked till uh, the end of the day there was a village that we found we asked the peasant could we stay for the night and they let us stay and in early in the morning, we left to continue our journey from one place to another, to one train to another train. While so many Nazis were willing accomplices to Hitler's obsession to destroy the Jewish people, the Nazi who took my parents on their death march somehow couldn't pull the trigger. Did he discover his humanity in that moment? Did he worry that he'd be damned for eternity? Or did he realize he just didn't have the stomach for cold-blooded murder? We have often wondered. There were German soldiers who had been killers who did not kill because they wanted to kill, but because they were afraid not to kill. Because they were afraid of losing face in front of their colleagues, in front of their comrades. Because they were afraid of consequences of their officers. They were afraid of being called cowards. When he took a man and a woman, a pregnant woman, into the woods, it then was not up to his officer it was not been up to his comrades, it was not up to his fellow SS men, his fellow Gestapo people. It was up to him one-on-one. -on -one. This is remarkable. Many of us are prepared to do things in privacy with the full knowledge that we will not get caught, that are awful and evil and terrible, which we would never do in public where could, we could possibly get caught. Here's somebody who could do something in public that was terrible and awful. But in privacy, when it was only him, a man and a woman, and perhaps God, he just couldn't do it. 